stories from the jungle and bush, from the lush savannas and from the coastal plains. And they are real cities in the most modern Western sense, with their frantic activity, chromium buildings, traffic jams and urban decay. The impact of urban growth may be even greater in developing countries, for it is occurring on top of a mass of other problems which the industrialized nations of the world have to some degree already solved. In the past three decades, the lid has blown off the cities of Africa. The populations of cities like Lagos, Ibadan, and Accra in West Africa have experienced a growth rate almost double that of the world average. Most of the people living in these cities were not born in them. They're migrants. Where do they come from? Why do they come? What role does the city play in today's Africa? Untold centuries, the key to life in Africa, the cornerstone of economies and of nations, and a village on the land. Today, close to 85% of Africa's peoples live in small settlements like this. The farmer tends his crops within walking distance of his compound. The fisherman brings his catch to the village center for processing and distribution. Yeah. Most of the people living in these villages are farmers or fishermen. For centuries, the land has been passed down from generation to generation, assuring a strong rural base to fill the food requirements of an expanding population. The individual's outlook is communalized, socialized. There's a unity of purpose here, and strong ties binding together the individual, the tribe, and the land. But today, changes are taking place rapidly. Perhaps the one development most likely to affect today's rural African is the move toward the cities. Cities are not a new phenomenon on the African continent. Large urban centers were in existence and thriving long before the discovery of North America. Zaria, in northern Nigeria, is an old city, founded about the year 1000 AD. It's a city imbued with profound cultural and historical significance, surrounded by old walls and even older ideals. Most of the city's 100,000 inhabitants are Muslims, as a religious and political center, Zaria has for centuries attracted Hausa people from all over northern Nigeria. You won't hear the blaring of car horns here or the roar of city traffic. You may, if you're lucky, hear the sound of the court drummer announcing the arrival of a delegation to the Emir of Zaria. It's a traditional city, more concerned with preserving the past than laying hold of the future. As well as being a religious and political center, Zaria is, and always has been, a major center for traditional artisans of every sort. In fact, the city is divided into wards. In each ward lives a particular type of craftsman. This section of the town is reserved for the dyers. Much of the indigo cloth produced in northern Nigeria originates here. Traditionally, the city provides a ready-made production and distribution center for these goods, with traders and merchants coming here from hundreds of miles away to conduct their business. The dyer's craft is an ancient one. The methods handed down from father to son. 
This man's father, grandfather, and great-grandfather were also dyers in Zaria. If he has his way, his sons will carry on after him. In another ward, not far away, live the weavers. Again, it's a craft handed down from father to son or from master to apprentice. The hope is always that the new generation will carry on the traditions of the past. It's the individual and his skill who is the center here, not the factory. It's pride in the product of the human hand and mind which dominates, not the cult of the machine. Tradition is strong too in daily life. For Muslim women, even though they may not wear the veil, life is severely circumscribed. The young women generally are compelled to stay within the compound. It's only the men who are permitted to follow a trade, to conduct business, or to move freely about the city streets. For Muslims living here, particularly the older generation, the style of life is largely dictated by the principles of Islam. A man exercises total control over his wives and children. The head of the household teaches, the family obeys. If any old person lives in his compound and just teaches his young ones, ladies and boys, things to do, things not to do. If he's a learned man, he teaches them how to pray and other things, how to just to do well to the, their superiors, how to obey orders and such and such. That's what it is. It is the same thing with the old woman. Ibrahim Madochi is 73 years old. He has three wives, 21 children, and 46 grandchildren. Like most Muslims, he's an educated man. He hopes that his sons will see more of the world than he was able to. He also hopes that they will remain in the old city when they grow up. But there is a contradiction here. For as the young people learn more and more of the outside world, the pull of the 20th century tends to draw them away from their traditional surroundings. The older residents of Zaria may live, grow old, and die often within the city walls, having seen little or nothing of the modern world. But for the new generation, growing up with the knowledge that the city wall is not a true horizon, dissatisfaction with the old ways often leads to a restless search for something new. For those who do not wish to follow the path of tradition, there is at least one clear option available. The road from the old city leads to the highway scarcely a half mile away, and the highway leads to a different world. The capital cities of West Africa, contact points between Africa and the rest of the world. Here can be found all the elements that go toward making up the village, the tribe, the town clashing headlong with the elements of the 20th century urban metropolis. Often built on the sites of traditional cities like Zaria, these new urban giants now boast populations numbering in the millions. Once the colonialists came, some of these traditional cities were chosen as the headquarters for the colonial administration. So there were centers of um, clerks, bureaucracies, they became centers of modern trade as well. Many of them, once chosen for administrative purposes, have grown quite rapidly. In the early years of this century, the growth was fairly slow by modern standards. The number of immigrants matching the new employment opportunities in the town. Of course, it's only after World War II that the influx into the towns has been extremely rapid. Why do they come? What attracts a migrant from the countryside to come and settle in the city with its noise, its traffic jams, and all the stresses of modern city life? The pull of the city, for, for economic reasons, everybody believes that Lagos is the Eldorado for Nigeria. You can come to Lagos and get a job. or if you, Even if you can't get a job immediately, you'll get some people you can live with. And there is that appeal of the fast city life. It is in Lagos that you have the latest of all the Western styles of clothing, of dancing, of singing, and all these are by themselves attractions to the young school leaver. 
and he liked to be described as the man from Lagos. People in the rural areas now are living off the land and their money doesn't play such a part in uh, their economic lives. But as soon as you give education to these people, you bring them to the cities, you give them education. Whereas they are in the boarding institutions, you give them the kind of food, you know, which is different from what they were used to, while they were living in the villages and so forth and so on. You are naturally, you know, doing everything to attract them to leave their old surroundings and come and seek a new life, you know, in the cities. A new life and a new way of living. For in the city, money is the key. Without money, survival here is almost impossible. The city attracts the young in particular. It's easier for them to adapt to the new world. In some cases, the city provides a place where they can earn money to pay taxes their impoverished lands at home cannot produce. Or perhaps to earn the cash to pay a bride price, to purchase a car or a bicycle, or even to build a home back in the village. Whatever the motive for coming to the city, the rural immigrant is much more liable to be confronted by the impact of European and Western culture than is his brother who stays at home. The city generates newly felt needs and newly created desires, and it provides a means towards satisfying these new demands, wage labor. Most of the new industrial developments now have taken place in the big cities. So there are no job opportunities in the villages. After you've completed your education, you cannot go to the village, you know, and uh, practice the kind of person farming, you know, what your father has been doing. So you have to stay in the city and find a job to do. For the rural migrant, the highest paying jobs are to be found in industry. It's a vicious cycle. The cities attract investment and therefore industry. To service industry, governments spend an enormous portion of their revenue in the cities. The countryside is drained of development resources and therefore people flock to the cities in search of employment. The result is massive unemployment and a call for more industrialization to meet the demand for jobs. The workers may be the sons of farmers or village craftsmen, trading in a traditional occupation for the endless mechanical routine of the modern world and for the pay packet that emerges at the end of the week. The switch is often made out of economic necessity. Quite a lot of people who in fact haven't completed primary education also come to the towns. In a survey that we did in um, Lagos, it appeared that a number of people working in the industrial estates there had in fact been trained in their hometowns as craftsmen, tailors, bricklayers and so on. But either because uh, there was too much competition in these spheres or because they hadn't the uh, cash resources to start themselves up in business, had come into um, Lagos to seek for wage employment. For the wage earner, the change in his way of life doesn't end at the conclusion of the working day. Cash earned means cash to spend, and while some of the individual's earnings may find their way back to the countryside, a lot of money stays in the city. Those with money in their pockets are constantly bombarded by modern advertising to spend their incomes on a wide variety of products, many of them imported and therefore desirable. Like our own cities, the African metropolis is composed of haves and have-nots. Only the gulf is usually much wider. For those with education, money, or both, life can be very enjoyable. A new class of African has emerged here, the urban elite for whom the city offers a wide range of luxuries and a lifestyle previously only available to Westerners or Europeans. For the super elites, the private clubs and swimming pools. Here you can find the managers of large companies, the doctors and lawyers, the highest ranking civil servants and their families the educated and moneyed elite. 
whose high salaries are often paid for in large part by taxes collected from the rural sector of the economy. In the downtown areas, the tastes of the well-to-do are catered to by modern department stores and supermarkets. In a store like this, a small tin of imported biscuits may cost five dollars. Imported chocolate, 50 cents to a dollar a bar. A small imported car may run as high as ten thousand dollars. Yet on any afternoon, the shops are crowded with people willing and able to pay these inflated prices for goods from abroad. The African urban elites live well. The housing estates for the well-to-do are frequently areas which were at one time the exclusive preserves of colonial administrators and foreign businessmen. Vast tracts of city land support a few spacious dwellings with their staffs of servants, air conditioning, and ever-present signs to discourage the unwary. They speak of privacy and of affluence. For these super elites who have achieved their positions of power largely through education, the city offers another advantage. The best schools are located here with the best facilities and the best teachers. The children of today's upper classes are thus able to perpetuate the establishment founded by their parents. The relations between the Asantes and the British on the coast. Most of them are still in their middle age and their children are at school but they tend to be at the very top uh, schools in the country so that uh, everybody who is uh, highly educated in a position of uh, great influence at the present time is able to get his children a good education which will ensure that they in turn will occupy a, a fairly high position in the society. For the majority of city dwellers, the other 95% of the population, life is somewhat less attractive. Living conditions are crowded, often squalid. Many immigrants to the city find themselves paying high rents to gouging landlords for the privilege of living in accommodations which are makeshift at best, with several families occupying one dwelling and as many as 10 people to a room. In many cases, their compounds in the village or town were far superior to what they find here. For the children of these migrants, education is far from guaranteed. Schools, electricity, running water, all the things we take for granted and pay for through our taxes are simply too expensive here. In a city where the average income for a family may be $200 a year, the collecting of taxes to finance large-scale urban development is a practical impossibility. The funds which are available to municipal governments seldom find their way up these back streets. It's often more tempting to spend money on steel and concrete skyscrapers than on adequate housing for the urban poor. Well, in this part of the world, we have um, peculiar problems. Housing in the first instance. The housing types we've got are comparatively poor compared with what we have in, in Canada, uh, where I know a little about. Generally, there is the po uh, problem of sewage disposal, um, clearance of refuse in the city. Um, generally, the standard of hygiene is quite low and uh, there is quite a lot of work required to be done to bring this to the standard that is expected of a big urban settlement. Perhaps the biggest problem for city governments is where to begin. In this city, close to one million people are jammed together into an area of 60 square miles, a density of almost 17,000 people per square mile. Aside from the physical problems created by urban overcrowding, there are the social pressures and conflicts which often result in high crime rates and social unrest in the city's poorer areas. Surprisingly, however, African cities like this seldom explode into civil disorder. 
One reason may be the existence of strong ethnic groups in the population. These groups and associations may be religious or political in nature, or they may simply be composed of members from a particular village or clan who gather together for self-help and mutual protection. In the case of the large religious groups, like these Muslims, the faith can act as a safety valve. In the frantic and often oppressive struggle to survive in the city, it's easy for the individual to lose his sense of identity. On special occasions throughout the year, the city's Muslims will gather together for social events or for prayer, providing the individual with a chance to re-establish his sense of identity and community. These groups are of particular importance to the migrant. A Muslim arriving here from the rural areas would immediately find a place within a group holding similar religious beliefs and with an obligation to aid him in finding a job and a place to live. It's also likely that he would find relatives within the community on whom he could rely for counsel and support during his initial adjustment to a new way of life. Groups like this act as a bridge from the old to the new, from the village path to the city street. For the majority of people, life in the city is in the streets. At any time of day, the streets are alive with traffic, both human and mechanical. It's in the thousands of small shops that line the roadways that most of the city's inhabitants make a living. The high-priced products of the industrial nation-state belong to a different world. For the thousands who possess no skill as artisans, private enterprise is the road to economic survival. Africans for centuries have been entrepreneurs of the highest order, and the city has emerged as perhaps the biggest marketplace of all. What will strike anybody coming into the city is the small scale of um, trading activities going on. If you went into any local market, many of which are bound within the city, you find that the women in particular dominate the activities in this area. And one is not surprised that women in particular contribute a great deal towards the upkeep of various families. Every big town has got an enormous marketplace in the center. Marketplaces in Accra, in Kumasi, and if you look in Nigeria, vast markets in Lagos and in the eastern region, certainly before the war, there were very, very large markets. And the interesting thing about these markets is in West Africa, they're almost always run by women, that the women control the market. Now, most of the food that comes from the countryside into the town is organized through these markets and governments have really got to pay attention to the interests of market traders. Now these market traders are very large in number, they control an enormous amount of business, they're usually quite small scale, though some of them are quite big and very important. These market mammies frequently amass considerable wealth. Many deal in textiles bought wholesale from European firms, three or four thousand dollars worth at a time which they then sell retail through their own employees on the street. Many become wealthy enough to build themselves large modern houses and send their sons and daughters to Britain or Canada for their education. Most of these women are illiterate or semi-literate. Yet in one case, three market women trading in partnership had a turnover of close to half a million dollars a year. The city then is a place where even the uneducated can make it big given the right circumstances. The crowded railway stations in every major urban center are ample proof of this, and the results can be disastrous. Well, thousands of people are flocking to the cities, you know, from the rural areas. 
and this is bad. In the first place, countries like ours depend a lot on farmers for our own food production. Also, the farmer is the one who grows the cocoa and so on for export. If the farmer stops producing, maybe because he can't get labor anymore, the country can go bankrupt very quickly. So we have to do something soon. Government is going to have to say agriculture is just as important as big cities and big industry. So get back to the land, or we are going to be in serious trouble. The same things that attract a rural North American to Toronto or New York attract the rural African to the city. Cash, the magical elixir, the search for a better life, the drive to earn more in order to buy more. And in the end, the cities of Africa face many of the same problems we do. The choking swarms of cars and trucks that clog the few available roads, threatening to strangle the city's lifelines. Cars purchased perhaps at the expense of an education or of adequate housing. Purchased because of a desire for the status that mobility provides. Urban decay, brought on by an inability to cope with the massive influx of migrants of childbearing age. Discontent brought on by the wide division between the elites, who have plenty of room to breathe, and the urban poor, who must make do with cramped living conditions and limited opportunities for advancement. Chronic unemployment, as the number of migrants outstrips the number of available jobs. It's hard to say what the future will hold. For most, Life will go on as always, and a new generation of city dwellers will grow up with no knowledge of the land their parents may have left behind. And as the cities grow larger and larger, the needs of the metropolis will become even greater. More administrators and civil servants. An increase in industrial development at the expense of agriculture. The siphoning off of funds from the rural areas in order to keep the city alive and growing. In short, a pattern which has already begun to erode many of our own urban giants. Whether trading off the traditions of the past for a new tradition in concrete and steel is a good bargain or not, only the future will tell. For Africans, human values have always been of paramount importance. To maintain this humanism in the face of modernization will be a challenge of monumental proportions. <laughs> <laughs>